Okay, friends, we're moving on to chapter 12 now, Peter's first battle. While the dwarf and the white witch were saying this, miles away, the beavers and the children were walking on hour after hour into what seemed a delicious dream. Long ago, they had left the coats behind them, and by now they had even stopped saying to one another, Look, there's a kingfisher, or I say bluebells, or what was that lovely smell? Or just listen to that thrush. They walked on in silence, drinking it all in, passing through the patches of warm sunlight into cool green thickets and out again into wide mossy glades where the tall elms raised the leafy roof far above overhead. And then into dense masses of flowering cur current and among hawthorn bushes where the sweet smell was almost overpowering. They had been just as surprised as Edmund when they saw the winter vanishing and the whole wood passing in a few hours or so from January to May. They hadn't even known for certain, as the witch did, that this was what would happen when Aslan came to Narnia. But they all knew that it was her spells which had produced the endless winter, and therefore they all knew when this magic spring began that something had gone ver had gone wrong and badly wrong with the witch's schemes. After the thaw had been going on for some time, they all realized that the witch would no longer be able to use her sledge. After that, they didn't hurry so much, and they allowed themselves more rests and longer ones. They were pretty tired by now, of course, but not what... I'd call bitterly tired, only slow and feeling very dreamy, and quiet inside as one does when one is coming to the end of a long day in the open. Susan had a slight blister on one heel. They had left the course of the big river some time ago. One for one had to turn a little to the right, that meant a little to the south, to reach the place of the stone table. Even if this had not been their way, they couldn't have kept to the river valley once the thaw began, for with all that melting snow, the river was soon in the river was soon in flood, a wonderful roaring, thundering yellow flood, and their path would have been under water. And now the sun got low and the light got redder and the shadows got longer and the flowers began to think about closing. Not now, said Mr. Beaver, and began leading them uphill across some very deep, springy moss. It felt nice under their tired feet in place, in a place where only tall trees grew wide apart, very wide apart. The climb coming at the end of the long day made them all pant and blow, and just as Lucy was wondering whether she could really get to the top without another long rest, suddenly they were at the top, and this is what they saw. They were on a green open space from which you could look down on the forest spreading as far as one could see in every direction, except right ahead. There, far to the east, was something twinkling and moving, by gum, whispered Peter to Susan, the sea. In the very middle of this open slab of gray stone, supported on four upright, oh, sorry. In the very middle of this open hilltop was the stone table. It was a great grim slab of gray stone supported on four upright stones. It looked very old and it was cut all over with strange lines and figures that might be the letters of an unknown language. They gave you a curious feeling when you looked at them. Next thing they saw was a pavilion pitched on one side of the open place. A wonderful pavilion it was, and especially now when the light of the setting sun fell upon it with sides of what looked like yellow silk and cords of crimson and tent pegs of ivory. And high above it, on a pole of on a pole, a banner which bore a red rampant, rampant lion fluttering in the breeze, which was blowing in their faces from the far-off sea. While they were looking at this, they heard a sound of music on their right, and turning in that direction, they saw what they had come to see. Aslan stood on, in the center 
of a crowd of creatures who had grouped themselves around him in the shape of a half moon. There were tree women, there were wet and there were tree women, there and well women, dryads and naiads, as they used to be called in our world, who had stringed instruments. It was they who had made the music. There were four great centaurs. The horse part of them was like huge English farm horses, and the man part was like stern but beautiful giants. There was also a unicorn and a bull with the head of a man, and a pelican and an eagle, and a great dog. And next to Aslan stood two leopards, of whom one carried his crown and the other his standard. But as for Aslan himself, the beavers and the children didn't know what to do or say when they saw him. People who have not been in Narnia sometimes think that a thing cannot be good and terrible at the same time. If the children had ever thought so, they were cured of it now. For when they tried to look at Aslan's face, they just caught a glimpse of the golden mane and the great, royal, solemn, overwhelming eyes, and then they found they couldn't look at him and went all trembly. Go on, whispered Mr. Beaver. No, whispered Peter, you first. No, sons of Adam before animals, whispered Mr. Beaver back again. Here's a picture of Aslan and all the creatures surrounding him. Susan, whispered Peter, what about you, ladies first? No, you're the eldest, whispered Susan. And of course, the longer that went on doing this, the more awkward they felt. Then, at last, Peter realized that it was up to him. He drew his sword and raised it to the salute, and hastily saying to the others, Come on, pull yourselves together, he advanced to the lion and said, We have come, Aslan. Welcome, Peter, son of Adam, said Aslan. Welcome, Susan and Lucy, daughters of Eve. Welcome, he beaver and she beaver. His voice was deep and rich, and somehow took the fidgets out of them. They now felt glad and quiet, and it didn't seem awkward to them to stand and say nothing. But where is the fourth? asked Aslan. He has betrayed, he has tried to betray them and joined the white witch, oh Aslan, said Mr. Beaver. And then something made Peter say, that was partly my fault, Aslan. I was angry with him, and I think that helped him to go wrong. And Aslan said nothing, either to excuse Peter or to blame him, but merely stood looking at him with his great unchanging eyes. And it seemed to all of them that there was nothing to be said. Please, Aslan, said Lucy, can anything be done to save Edmund? All shall be done, said Aslan, but it may be harder than you think. And then he was silent again for some time. But to that moment, up to that moment, Lucy had been thinking how royal and strong and peaceful his face looked. Now it suddenly came to her that his, to her head, that he looked sad as well. But next minute that expression was quite gone. The lion shook his mane and clapped his paws together. Terrible paws, thought Lucy, if he didn't know how to velvet them and said, Meanwhile, let the feast be prepared. Ladies, take these daughters of Eve to the pavilion and minister to them. When the girls had gone, Aslan laid his paws, his paw, and though it was velveted, it was very heavy, on Peter's shoulder and said, Come, son of Adam, and I will show you a far-off sight of the castle where you are to be king. And Peter, with his sword still drawn in his hand, went with the lion to the eastern edge of the hilltop. There a beautiful sight met their eyes. The sun was setting behind their backs. That meant the whole country below them lay in the evening light. Forest and hills and valleys and winding, and winding away like a silver snake the lower part of the great river. And beyond all this, miles away was the sea and beyond the sea the sky, full of clouds which were just turning rose color with the reflection of the sunset. 
but just where the land of Narnia met the sea, in fact, at the mouth of the great river, there was something on a little hill shining. It was shining because it was a castle, and of course the sunlight was reflected from all the windows which looked toward Peter and the sun set. But to Peter it looked like a great star resting on the seashore. That, O oh man, said Aslan, is Care Paravel of the Four Thrones, in one of which you must sit as king. I show it to you because you are the firstborn, and you will be high king over all the rest. And once more Peter said nothing, for at that moment a strange noise woke the silence suddenly. It was like a bugle, but richer. It is your sister's horn, said Aslan to Peter in a low voice, so low as to be almost a purr, if it is not disrespectful to think of a lion purring. For a moment, Peter did not understand. Then, when he saw all the other creatures start forward and heard Aslan say with a wave of his paw, Back! Let the prince win his spurs! He did understand, and set off running as hard as he could to the pavilion, and there he saw a dreadful sight. The naiads and dryads were scattering in every direction. Lucy was running toward him as fast as her short legs would carry her, and her face was as white as paper. Then he saw Susan make a dash for a tree and swing herself up, followed by a huge gray beast. At first Peter thought it was a bear. Then he saw that it looked like an Al Alsatian, though it was far too big to be a dog. Then he realized that it was a wolf, a wolf standing on its, on its hind legs with its front paws against the tree trunk, snapping and snarling. All the hair on its back stood up on end. Susan had not been able to get higher than the second big branch. One of her legs hung down so that her foot was only an inch or two above the snapping teeth. Peter wondered why she did not get higher or at least take a better grip. Then he realized that she was just going to faint and that, she fa that if she fainted, she would fall off. Peter did not feel very brave. Indeed, he felt he was going to be sick, but that made no difference to what he had to do. He rushed straight up to the monster and aimed a slash of his sword at its side. That stroke never reached the wolf. Quick as lightning, it turned around its eyes flaming and its mouth wide open in a howl of anger. If it did not... If it had not been so angry that it simply had to howl, it would have got him by the throat at once. As it was, though all this happened to be, happened too quickly for Peter to think at all. He had just time to duck down and plunge his sword as hard as he could between the brute's four legs into its heart. Then came a horrible, confused moment, like something in a nightmare. He was struggling and pulling, and the wolf seemed neither alive nor dead, and its bared teeth knocked against his forehead and everything was blood and heat and hair a moment later he found the mo that the monster lay dead and he had drawn his sword out of it and was straightening his back and rubbing the sweat off his face and out of his eyes he felt tired all over then after a bit susan came down the tree she and peter felt pretty shaky when they met and i won't say there wasn't kissing and crying on both sides but narnia but in narnia no one thinks any the worse of you for that quick quick shouted the voice of aslan centaurs eagles i see another wolf in the thickets there behind you he has just started away after him all of you he will be going to the mistress now is your chance to find the witch and rescue the fourth son of adam and instantly, with a thunder of hoofs and beating of wings and dozen or so of the swiftest creatures disappeared into the gathering darkness. Peter, still out of breath, turned and saw Aslan close at hand. You have forgotten to clean your sword, said Aslan. It was true Peter blushed when he looked at the bright red blade and saw it all smeared with the wolf's hair and blood. He stooped down and wiped it clean on the grass and then wiped it quite dry on his coat. Hand it to me and kneel, son of Adam, said Aslan, and when Peter had done so, he struck him with the flat of the blade and said, Rise up, sir Peter Wolf's mane, and whatever happens, never forget to wipe your sword. That, friends, is the end of chapter 12. We are now moving on to chapter 13, The Deep Magic from the Dawn of Time. 
Now we must get back to Edmund. When he had been made to walk far further than he had ever known that anyone could walk, the witch at last halted in a dark valley all overshadowed with fir trees and yew trees. Edmund simply sank down and lay on his face doing nothing at all, and not even caring what was going to happen next, provided they would let him lie still. He was too tired even to notice how hungry and thirsty he was. The witch and the dwarf were talking close beside him in low tones. No, said the dwarf. No, it is no use now, O queen. They must have reached the stone table by now. Perhaps the wolf will smell us out and bring us news, said the witch. It cannot be good news if he does, said the dwarf. Four thrones in Care Paravel, said the witch. How if only three were filled? That would not fulfill the prophecy. What difference would that make now that he is here, said the dwarf. He did not dare even now to mention the name of Aslan to his mistress. He may not stay long, and then we would fall upon the three at care. Yet it might be better, said the dwarf, to keep this one, here he kicked Edmund, for bargaining with. Yes, and have him rescued, said the witch scornfully. Then, said the dwarf, we had better do what we have to do at once. I would like to have done it on the stone table itself, said the witch. That is the proper place. That is where it shall always, that is where it has always been done before. It will be a long time now before the stone table can again be put to its proper use, said the dwarf. True, said the witch, and then, well, I will begin. At that moment, with a rush and a snarl, wolf rushed up to them. I have seen them. They are all at the stone table with him. They have killed my captain, Margrim. I was hidden in the thickets and saw it all. One of the sons of Adam killed him. Fly, fly! No, said the witch. There need be no flying. Go quickly. Summon all, the, all our, our people to meet me. Here, as speedily as they can. Call out to the to the giants and the wolves and the spirits and those in the trees who are on our side. Call the ghouls and the, and the bogles and the ogres and the minotaurs. Call the cruels, the hags, the specters and the people of the toadstools. We will fight. What? Have I not still my wand? Will not their ranks turn into stone even as they come on? Be off quickly. I have a little thing to finish here while you are away. The great brute bowed its head, turned, and galloped away. Now, she said, we have no table. Let me see. We had better put it against the trunk of a tree. Edmund found himself being roughly forced to his feet. Then the dwarf set, set him with his back against a tree and bound him fast. He saw the witch take off her outer man mantle. Her arms were bare underneath it and terribly white. Because they were so very white, he could see them, but he could not see much else. It was so dark in this valley under the dark trees. Prepare the victim, said the witch. And the dwarf undid Edmund's collar and folded back his shirt in at the neck. Then he took Edmund's hair and pulled his head back so that he had to raise his chin. After that, Edmund heard a strange noise. Whiz, whiz, whiz. For a moment, he couldn't think what it was. Then he realized it was the sound of a knife being sharpened. At that very moment, he heard loud shouts from every direction, a drumming of hooves and a beating of wings, a scream th from the witch, confusion all around, and then he found he was being untied. Strong arms were around him, and he heard big, kind voices saying things like, Let him lie down. Give him some wine. Drink this. Steady now. You'll be all right in a minute. Then he heard the voices of people who were not talking to him, but to one another. And they were saying things like, Who's got the witch? I thought you had her. I didn't see her after I knocked the knife out of her hand. I was after the dwarf. Do you mean to say she's escaped? A chap can't mind everything at once. What's that? Oh, sorry, it's only an old stump. But just at, that, at this point, Edmund went off in a dead faint. Presently, the centaurs and the unicorns and the deer and birds 
They were, of course, the rescue party which Aslan had sent in the last chapter, all set off to go back to the stone table, carrying Edmund with them. But if they could have seen what happened in the valley after they had gone, I think they might have been surprised. It was perfectly still, and presently the moon grew bright. If you had been there, you would have seen the moonlight shining on an old tree stump and on a fair-sized boulder. But if you had gone on looking, you would have gradually begun to think there was something odd about both the stump and the boulder. And next, you would have thought that the old stump did look really remarkably like the little fat crouching man, like like a little fat man crouching on the ground. And if you had watched long enough, you would have seen the stump walk across to the boulder and the boulder sit up and begin talking to the stump. For in reality, the stump and the boulder were simply the witch and the dwarf, for it was her part for it was part of her magic that she could make things look like they weren't. And she had the presence of mind to do so at that very moment when the knife was knocked out of her hand. She had kept hold of her wand, so it had been kept safe too. When the other children woke up next morning, they had been sleeping on piles of, of cushions in the pavilion. The first thing they heard from Mrs. Beaver was that their brother had been rescued and brought into camp late last night, and was at that very moment with Aslan. As soon as they had breakfast, they all went out, and there they saw Aslan and Edmund walking together in the dewy grass, apart from which, apart from the rest of the court. There is no need to tell you, and no one ever heard, what Aslan was saying, but it was a conversation which Edmund never forgot. As the others drew nearer, Aslan turned to meet them, bringing Edmund with him. Here is your brother, he said, and there is no need to talk to him about what is past. Edmund shook hands with each of the others and said to each of them in turn, I'm sorry, and everyone said, that's all right. And then everyone wanted very hard to say something, which would make it quite clear that they were all friends with him again and something ordinary and natural, and of course no one could think of anything in the world to say. But before they had time to feel really awkward, one of the leopards approached Aslan and said, Sire, there is a messenger from the enemy who craves audience. Let him approach, said Aslan. The leopard went away and soon returned leading the witch's dwarf. What is your message, son of earth? asked Aslan. The Queen of Narnia and Empress of the Lone Islands desires a safe conduct to come and speak with you, said the dwarf, on a matter which is as much to your advantage as to hers. Queen of Narnia indeed, said the Mr. Beaver. Of all the cheek. Peace, Beaver, said Aslan. All names will soon be restored to their proper owners. In the meantime, we will not dispute about them. Tell your mistress, son of earth, that I grant her safe conduct on condition that she leaves her wand behind her at the great oak. I think, friends, I might take a moment to turn on the light since it's getting a little dark outside. go much better. Okay. This was agreed to and two leopards went back with the dwarf to see that the conditions were properly carried out. But supposing she turns the two leopards into stone, whispered Lucy to Peter. I think the same idea had occurred to the leopards themselves. At any rate, as they walked off, their fur was all standing up on their backs, and their tails were bristling like a cat's when it sees a strange dog. It'll be all right, whispered Peter in reply. He wouldn't send them if it weren't. A few minutes later, the witch herself walked out on top of walked out onto the top of the hill and came straight across and stood before Aslan. The three children, who had not seen her before, felt shudders running down their backs at the sight of her face, and there were low growls among the animals present. Though it was bright, though it was bright sunshine, everyone felt suddenly cold. 
The only two people present who seemed to be quite at their ease were Aslan and the witch herself. It was the oddest thing to see those two faces, the golden face and the dead white face, so close together. Not that the witch looked at Aslan exactly in his eyes. Mrs. Beaver particularly noticed this. You have a traitor there, Aslan, said the witch. Of course, everyone present knew that she meant Edmund, but Edmund had got past thinking himself, thinking about himself. After all he'd been through and after the talk he'd had that morning, he just went on looking at Aslan. It didn't seem to matter what the witch said. Well, said Aslan, his offense was not against you. Have you forgotten the deep magic? asked the witch. Let us say I have forgotten it, answered Aslan gravely. Tell us of this deep magic. Tell you, said the witch, her voice growing suddenly shriller. Tell you what is written on the very table of stone which stands beside us. Tell you what is written in letters deeper, deep as a spear is long on the fire stones on the secret hill. Tell you what is engraved on the scepter of the emperor beyond the sea. You at least know the magic which the emperor put into Narnia at the very beginning. You know the, that every traitor belongs to me as my lawful prey, and therefore every treachery I have, excuse me, belongs to me as my lawful prey, and that for every treachery I have a right to a kill. Oh, said Mr. Beaver, so that's how you came to imagine yourself a queen, because you were the emperor's hangman. I see. Peace, Beaver, said Aslan, with a very low growl. And so, continued the witch, that human creature is mine. His life is forfeit to me. His blood is my property. Come and take him then, said the bull with the man's, with the man's head in a great bellowing voice. Fool, said the witch, with a savage smile all was, that was almost a snarl. Do you really think your master can rob me of my rights by mere force? He knows the deep magic better than that. He knows that unless I have blood as the law says, all Narnia will be overturned and perish in fire and water. It is very true, said Aslan. I do not deny it. Oh, Aslan, whispered Susan in the lion's ear. Can't we, I mean... You won't, will you? Can't we do something about the deep magic? Isn't there something you can work against it? Work against the emperor's magic, said Aslan, turning to her with something like a frown on his face, and nobody ever made that suggestion to him again. Edmund was on the other side of Aslan, looking all the time at Aslan's face. He felt a choking feeling and wondered if he ought to say something. But a moment later, he felt that he was not expected to do anything except to wait and do what he was told. Fall back, all of you, said Aslan, and I will talk to the witch alone. They all obeyed. It was a terrible time, this, waiting and wondering while the lion and the witch talked earnestly together in low voices. Lucy said, oh, Edmund, and began to cry. Peter stood with his back to the others, looking out at the distant sea. The beavers stood holding each other's paws with their heads bowed. The centaurs stamped uneasily with their hooves, but everyone became perfectly still in the end, so that you noticed even small sounds like a bumblebee flying past or the birds in the forest down below, or the wind rustling the leaves. And still, the talk between Aslan and the witch went on. At last, they heard Aslan's voice. You can all come back, he said. I have settled the matter. She has renounced her claim on your brother's blood. And all over the hill, there was a noise as if everyone had been holding their breath and had now begun breathing again. And then a murmur of talk. The witch was just turning away, a look of fierce joy on her face when she stopped and said, but how do I know this promise will be kept? Roar, roared Aslan, half rising from his throne, and his great mouth opened wider and wider, and the roar grew louder and louder, and the witch, after staring for a moment with her lips wide apart, 
picked up her skirts and fairly ran for her life. That, friends, is the end of chapter 13. Next week, we will begin reading chapter 14, The Triumph of the Witch.